Okay, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Obari Gomba and you all to the African Studies Seminar this week. We have a series of introductions for Dr. Gomba. I would like now to hand over to Maria, who will introduce Torch and Dr. Obari as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Maria Blanco, and I'm the academic champion at, uh, for Networks, programs and international partnerships at the Oxford Research Center for the Humanities, also known as TORCH. And um, I'm also an associate professor in Spanish American literature at the Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to be here to introduce and to see Dr. Gumba in person. Uh, at today's seminar. Uh, we have been waiting for him, we can say, for an incredibly long time. <laughs> Dr. Gumba is, of course, the latest addition to the group of renowned international scholars who have come to Torch and to Oxford um, as Global South visiting professors. And this is a joint initiative with All Souls College. It was established in 2017, and it's one of Torch's flagship programs of which we are incredibly proud. And its aim is really to invite scholars from beyond Europe and Anglo-America to come to Oxford, where they can spend an intensive period of research over the course of a term, and also to engage in collaborative projects with academics here in Oxford. Um, I'm sure David is going to introduce Dr. Gumba, is going to, uh, to talk about everything that this incredible guest has done. Um, but I wanted to point something out uh, about Dr. Gumba, who was at the, at the Writers' Workshop, at the International Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa. Um, and there he produced a work called A Piece of Daily Life, which he prepared for the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. And this work features uh, the writings of 35 uh, different writers who hail from 33 different countries. Um, and of course, we have been waiting for Dr. Ngumba for the whole of the pandemic, and now he's here. But with that comes a lot, uh, a, a process of, um, well, of being away from home. And when Dr. Gumba was at Iowa, uh, he considered the, what the potential legacy is of somebody who goes miles and miles away from home to be in a different institution um, and to think about making and reading poetry with people who are all away from home. And this is what we're going to be seeing today. We're, we're going to be hearing about literature from far away in Oxford. And um, despite the inevitable homesickness that comes with being away from home, and so far, especially when you come to Oxford, of all places, with this autumnal English weather, we are nevertheless thrilled to have him here uh, to broaden our knowledge about Nigerian and also African literature, but also for making Oxford and Torch and our community all the richer. And now pass it on to David. Thank you very much, Maria. So uh, for those of you who are new to African studies, uh, my name is David Pratton. I have the honor of chairing the seminar today. Um, I'm currently seconded to anthropology, which is why you haven't seen me around. So it's very nice to meet you all um, and to catch up with all of those of you who are not new to the center. Um, so today, it's a very great pleasure to welcome Abari Gomba to give today's seminar. Um, Abari is the 2021 Torch Global South visiting professor at All Souls, as you've heard. And so he's with us in Oxford this term. Abari's fellowship was originally planned for March 2020, which, if you remember, uh, was a rather eventful moment. <laughs> so it's uh, a great relief, finally, to host him here. And I think uh, both of us would want to convey our thanks to colleagues in Torch and All Souls for their work in making this finally happen. Abari Gomba teaches uh, literature and creative writing at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria, uh, which is where I know him from. Uh, we share a, a keen interest in the eco-aesthetics or environmental humanities or petroculture studies of the Niger Delta region. And much of his critical writing examines the work of poets and playwrights from across the oil-rich Niger Delta region. And as we'll hear in his paper, he's an expert in these literary traditions from this region and in Delta authors, some of whom will be well known to you, some much less so. Recently, for example, he chaired an international conference on uh, Tenure Ojaide 
Um, he's the, he was the coordinator of a literary festival on the work of Gabriel Okara. And Obari himself is a distinguished and award-winning poet and playwright. His own works engage uh, in critical themes of the petrostate, Niger Delta history, violence, grief, and intimacy. They include uh, Gorilla Post, which was the winner of the Association of Nigerian Authors Drama Prize in 2018, uh, for Every Homeland, which won the ANA Poetry Prize in 2017, Thunder Protocol, which won the same ANA Poetry Prize in 2016, and one of my favorites, Pearls of the Mangrove, um, adopted as the book of the festival in the 2011 Garden City Literary Festival in Port Harcourt, as well as the 2019 Festival of Poetry in Calabar. These are just some highlights um, from his work and by no means exhaustive um, of the Distinguished Writer Awards that he's received over the last decade or so. So these poems and uh, plays that he's written are reproduced and performed uh, regularly and he's a leading voice in the literary and arts world in Port Harcourt, including, for example, in the festival activities in 2014, when Port Harcourt was the UNESCO world book capital. So it's a very great pleasure to welcome Abari to Oxford finally and to introduce his paper today, which has the title Colonial Niger Delta and Intra-Regional Conflicts in Selected Nigerian Plays. Abari, over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, let me begin by thanking Professor David Pratin, uh, who started all this affair. Uh, he has worked very hard to make it possible that uh, first he got me interested in, in uh, taking up this fellowship and has worked very hard to make it possible. Uh, since I came to Oxford, he's been very highly supportive. Uh, I hope that when you come back to Nigeria, I can repay your hostilities. <laughs> I say that instead of hospitality. <laughs> All right, thank you. And so I'm also grateful to Torch. Uh, Torch has been wonderful. Uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to think that uh, of all the scholars in the world, uh, Touch has decided to make me uh, the Global South visiting professor for, for this year. I don't forget the Global South is, is larger than the Global North. So <laughs> it simply means that there were a lot of options. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thank you. Also, that's been great. Thank you also for making me a visiting fellow. So, I mean, I'm so lucky I'm here in, in dual capacity as a visiting professor of Touch and a visiting fellow to all souls. The African Studies Center has been interested in this talk even before I got on a plane from Nigeria. You know, so uh, they've worked very hard to make it possible. Thank you. Let it not be said that I did not thank my employer in Nigeria. Uh, that's the likelihood that uh, we have audience participating from Nigeria. And I want to put it on record that I'm grateful to my employer at the University of Putaco. Uh, for kindly allowing me to be away from my duties as the Associate Dean of Humanities and to be part of this fellowship. Okay, so our topic is Colonial Niger Data and Intra-Regional Conflicts in Selected Nigerian Plays. So I'm looking at four plays and three playwrights. Uh, me, Sonuma, Minimas, King Jaja, or The Tragedy of a Nationalist, that's a long title. Uh, Anno Dume Gege, both of them were published in 1997. All are to me, by far the most popular of uh, the three playwrights, is the author of Ovoramwe Nogbaisi, which was published in 1974. Ahmed Jerima, the author of The Trials of uh, Obavara, who was published in 1998. The interesting thing about these plays is that they are history plays, what the Romans were called the fabula pretexta. Uh, and the point is that what I've done in this study is to look at them as, uh, as literature. I've interpreted them as literature and not as history. Now, uh, the basic thing about the Fabula Protesta is that it doesn't pretend to be a replacement for history. Uh, it appropriates history, uses history as, 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 uh, as, a, as a source for its uh, creative resources, but it does not replace history. And by appropriating history in this manner, what it simply does is uh, to exercise the latitude of imagination and omission. I I'm more interested in omission, uh, because the truth is that if you're going to do a play on any life 
particularly a life as illustrious as the personages in this play, there's no way you can put everything about their life in the play. And again, our knowledge of history establishes that there are always gaps, okay? And so these are persons who lived decades ago, in the, in the last cent centuries ago, even now, because we're in the 21st century. So it's, it's practically impossible to capture everything that happened at that time. But what the playwright does is to engage that resource and to, and to determine what should be taken and what should be removed based on the necessities of craft. So the aim is to pursue very similitude, not exactitude. And what I've noticed is that in spite of the fact that writings of this kind appropriate, appropriate history from the past, they always have very contemporary promptings. Uh, there's always something uh, contemporary that inspires or motivates the writers to want to write plays on, on stuff that have happened in the past. Okay, so what's the setting? Collectively, these four plays cover the period between 1869 and 1897. King Jaja, uh, uh, which is uh, the first play that I have discussed, uh, covers 1869 and 1891. Gege, it covers possibly roughly the last five years of uh, King Jaja, the monarch's reign. Uh, Voramon Ogbaisi covers roughly 1895 to 1897. The Trials of Obavorawe is possibly a play that is set in the time around the last decade, the last year of the Obas, Obas reign. Okay, setting in places. King Jaja is set in Bonia and Opopo. Those are very important uh, colonial centers of power in the narratives of the Niger Delta. Odumegege alternates between Azumini and Opopo. Uh, Obavarawe is set in Benin, the Obas Palace, and the, the Bosha in the adjoining community. And then for the trials of Varaway, it begins in an unnamed location. Uh, I assume that that's possibly a transit camp because at this point, the play, the play is built on a flashback. At the point when the play begins, the Oba had already been dis deposed and uh, it's possibly in exile or uh, in a transit camp uh, awaiting uh, deportation from, from Benin. Uh, so as I've said before, this bunny and Opopo are very significant to this study because we're looking at them as centers of power. Someone is going to ask, um, the title of your work is Colonial Niger Delta, but you're looking principally as two powers of uh, centers of power. Now, how is that significant enough? How does it tell the entire story of the Niger Delta? Granted that Opopo and Boni are not the entire Niger Delta, but there are patterns of power and conflict that are seen in this play that have been corroborated by even historical scholars. And these patterns of power and conflict are replicated in a number of other historical sites, uh, like the conflict in Boni, between two sections in Boni, the conflict between Okrika and Eleme, and the conflict between the Shekris and Oruba, and, and many more. Okay, so why am I interested in intra-regional conflict? Now, for many works that depict the contest, the clash between uh, the colonial powers and indigenous people. Sc scholarly focus has always been on the presence of and the activities of the colonial power. So very often people who have discussed this place have paid attention to the activities of Britain as represented in this place. And they have also looked at the uneven power equation between the colonial power and these indigenous nationalities. That's a story that is often told. I've decided to look at a story that is often ignored or glossed over, and that is to look at how these plays have represented indigenous power structures within uh, the localities that is of, con of interest to us. Okay, so this is the structure of my paper. I'm going to go to it. Uh, it's, it's in... Uh, Five parts, yes. So let me add the work cited introduction. There's a section on uh, Jaja, and there's a section on Benin, and then the conclusion on the work cited. Okay, so let's do this. Now, beyond the capacity of colonial Britain 
to divide and rule its spheres of control, how do the history plays of Mieso Minima, Minima, Olarotimi, and Ahmed Yerima show the tendencies, motivations, tensions, dichotomies, and disharmonies between and amongst the ethnic nationalities of the Niger Delta? The plays indicate that a fractious region undermined itself even in the face of Britain's ruthless hegemony. It is the truth of art. There's a lot of significance and meaning in the intensity with which these plays beam their light on history. Now, history plays, which the Romans called the Fabula Protesta, draw from history, but the genre pretends, presents as art and is subject to the latitude of imagination and the necessity of omission. So to understand the history that anchors just plays is to understand that art does not seek to replace history. It seeks simply to be a representation of whatever is considered vital to the creative process and whatever serves the artistic judgment and temperament of a playwright. Now, it is a plus when a history play is mimetic enough to approximate history, not by exactitude, but by very similitude. And as Julio Mokoro says, a history play takes a retrospective view of society, indicative of truthfulness and reality, irrespective of its artistic or imaginative essence. And she's, she's, she's been able to put, she's decided to put truthfulness and reality in italics. And for that, I say that the words that she has placed in italics are instructive. Their meanings are modified by the processes of art. It is literature that is appropriating the resources of history. The colonial history of the Niger Delta has inspired several plays. Besides the primary texts that uh, we, we, we studied, we also have Olarotimi's Akasa Yomi. We have uh, Bergan's King Jaja, Matthew Mokoro's Nana Lomo, J.P. Clark's All for Oil. So why have we decided on these plays? It's because they are remarkable tests on two of the most iconic sites in the conflict of the Niger Delta. Uh, the conversation about colonial Niger Delta cannot be complete without a mention of what happened in Benin and what happened uh, in Opopo in the 19th century. So the fall of King Jaja in 1891 and Obavaro in 1897, amongst many, define Britain's decade of bloody conquest in the region, right on the threshold of the 20th century. That story is often told, thus this paper examines what is often ignored, and that is to look at the habits of power, the structures of power amongst indigenous people. Okay, so having said that, let's go to King Jaja's mimic imperialism in Minima's King Jaja and Odume Gege. Minima's eponymous place depict Opopo and his neighbors. Opopo was a powerful entity that emerged from the Bonin Civil War of 1869. Its strategic location on the Niger Delta coast and its trade relationship with the British made it grow rapidly into a center of power. And it was strong enough to dwarf its neighbors, including Bonin. King Jaja, by many accounts, a former slave, you can look at that in the works of Fiofori, and uh, Tokumbo judge, rose through the finance of time to become Opopo's potentate, empire builder, and mimic imperialist. In both of Minima's play, King Jaja is depicted as a man of force, seriously beyond a paradox of values and villainy. This is not to be romanticized, as Benjamin Geoffroy does when he says, King Jaja the play is an epic celebration of Jaja's life. Minima, the author, has written his plays as an insider of sorts. His ancestor, who is cast in both plays as Minima, is believed to have been one of the persons who fled from Bonny in 1869, and one of the original founders of Opopo, one of the authors of Opopo's instrument of governance, which bears his name. It's, it, that instrument of governance is called the Minima Agreement. Now, that document was crafted even before the flight of the Annie Purple section from uh, Boni to settle on the new island that became Opopo. So there are overlaps between Minima's plays. Both plays reinforce each other, and they offer a fuller view of the playwright's intention to portray Opopo from its formation to the fall of Jaja 
1891. Now, of the two plays, Odume Gege was the first to be performed in 1999 in Port Harcourt, my city, and he also had a number of stage runs. Uh, the Nigerian International Bank funded it in 1997. He made it this play of the year, and it has a very successful stage run around the country. Uh, King Jaja was premiered in 1992. But of the two, the playwright says that Jaja is the first in a planned trilogy. Uh, there is nothing to say if he wrote King Jaja before he wrote Odume Gege. But it's obvious that if you place both plays side by side, the, the timing of both plays indicates that Jaja started earlier. It, the setting of the plays in time indicates that ja King Jaja started earlier from about 1869 and ended in 1891. And Odume Gege covers just roughly the last years of King Jaja's reign, and it focuses on just one site of conflict, or one, one event, one conflict, one event of conflict uh, that, that was recorded on the path to Jaja's fall. Now, in the prefatory note to Odumegege, Minima admits that there are different versions of the conflict between Odumegege and King Jaja. But the play itself reveals, because our stand is on the play, it's not on history. The play itself reveals that Jaja is a stronger person, is a potentate around the area, and exercises his power uh, as an oppressor, and ultimately caused a lot of pain to the people of Azomini and executed uh, Odume Gege, who had challenged his control over the Azomini territory. So, now, there's something that I've noticed in this play, and that is that on Odume Gege, the playwright is not willing to take a moral position. But on King Jaja, he is willing to take a moral position. And he says that he was inspired to write that play because in in 1982, the British had a problem with Argentina over an island, and he felt inspired to write a play about the, the contact between the British and his own people in the previous decade. So it appears that where, whereas he's, he's willing to skirt around uh, the subject of moral rights in respect of Odume Gege, where his own ethnic nationality was the oppressor, he is willing to point out moral rights in the second play, where his ethnic nationality is the victim of oppression. Now, it's also obvious that before Opopo was established, at the moment when they were crafting this document of governance, there were indications that a seed of corruption was already viral in Opopo. Bonnie had imploded, and the uh, people section, it's weak in the polities of might. But the scale of force that the minimum section exercises is devastating, very devastating. They did not engage the other section as if it was part of Bonnie. They were out to crush them, uh, crush them totally, and that was the reason why they left. But at this stage, when the chieftains of the anti people section that became Opopo are having a conversation about their future, about their flight and their future. We hear them refer to the hinterland as the natives. And that is used repeatedly. That's a typical name that a British colonialist will use in response to the, to the hinterlands. And I, will be, I believe that that must have been influenced by decades of interaction between Boni and uh, and the British, and they have come to see themselves as an elite group, an elite nationality around that area. So their perception of the hinterland was the same as the perception of the British about the hinterland. So Popo appears to have known that it has its own tendency for abuse and corruption quite early. And so it makes effort to craft a document that will help them uh, govern themselves. But then we'll find out that in the conversation, Jaja is uneasy. He was not yet king, but he was uneasy with the liberal phrasing of this document. And that, uh, to many persons in the play, was an early indication that 
uh, he was interested in the accumulation of power, and and he was he has there was a likelihood that if he has that power accumulated or vested in him, he could abuse him. Surprisingly, he happens to be the one that the entire community chose to become, come the the Amayan about the king, and just in a few years, he was able to build a new settlement into a very powerful city-state or kingdom around that locality, so much so that it was controlling trade, it dwelt uh, Bonnie and it started oppressing the hinterland communities, which were the actual producers of the resources that the British were interested in. Opopo was not a resource-producing state. The, the hinterlands, the communities in the hinterland were the resource-producing communities. The British were interested in that resource. Jaja too and the Popo people were interested in that resource because it was obvious to them that whoever controls trade or dominates the interland was going to be in a position of accumulation and control. This is what a character in two names say, a character in the play in King Jaja says before the flight. It says, when they were having a conversation about creating a just state, making Opopo a just state, it says, but is it possible? Why are there wars today in Koloama? Koloama is the other name for Bonnie. Is it possible? Because it will soon be the same phase of war in the new settlement. The Alapu and the well connected will abuse the laws of the land and our rights. Lies will be truths, why truth will be punishable offense. The people will be kicked about or killed in the name of protecting the kingdom and the constitution. It's a shame that in the habits of power that we see in both plays, this fear that Tsunami expressed before the flight came to reality. But Tsunami himself was a man who had domestic slaves and was unwilling to grant them freedom. So he wanted freedom for himself as a citizen, but he was unwilling to grant freedom to his slaves. And that is also consistent with the habit of the entire aristocracy in Opopo. When Minima, the character, raises objections about King Jaja's personalization of resources and power in Odume Gege, and Oranta flees to take refuge with the colonialists, Opopo's abuses are coming home to roost with an aristocracy that has hitherto aided and profited from Opopo's encroachment on the statehood and rights of their neighbors. Many of the chiefs complain about the situation, but they continue to prop up their abusive state. And so is the duplicity of their oracle, Orugolo, who authorizes the sacrifice of seven persons to make Jaja prevail in an unjust war over the Zumini people, and then turns around to tell King Jaja not to execute Odume Gege, who had resisted his control over Zumini, and then turns around again to tell Jaja that the man has been taken to the shrine, and the, the executioners were hesitating and the leader should restate his order. And when Jaja gives the final order and the man is executed, he turns around to blame Jaja for killing the man and claims that the man has fought for justice. The same thing happens in Azumini. The people of Azumini, the chieftains, allow themselves to be pressured to kill a settler in order to win that war. Now, they have enough uh, moral position to withhold themselves from sacrificing a son of theirs to their deity, but they are willing to sacrifice a settler. And so we see there's a pattern, there's a disregard for life in this play, but the way that's of power, and it is also this disregard of life for life is in contrast with what I see as a very fierce regard for accumulation of wealth and exercise of power. There's an inordinate drive to accumulate wealth and exercise of power in both plays. King Jaja, the preeminent potentate in, the, in this axis of the Niger Delta, shows his greed, loss for power, and love for dominance. He pursues accumulation through cohesive trade processes, military expeditions, assimilation, and occupation of territories. And there were a lot of communities, resource-producing communities, that um, he attacked. He, had, he authorized military operations in those places, and some of those communities were destroyed because those communities refused to agree to his trade terms. And um, 
It's important that this playwright has brought this to our attention because the normal narrative is to look at how the British destroyed communities around the region because those communities refused to agree to the terms of Britain. So we we'll find out that it appears to be there's a contest of empires uh, in both plays. Uh, there's a local mimic imperialism that wants to that 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 exercises power in the same pattern that Britain. Uh, is known to have exercised power in, in that region. A lot of communities were destroyed, a lot of them were brought down. History also corroborates this fact. Even though I have looked at this place as history plays, I've also, where it is necessary, uh, cited history to support it. There are historical accounts by Stanley Okora for an Okparum Ejitu who say, counting on the, on the, uh, on the report of Percy Talbot, that Jaja's military expedition in Obono was very brutal. Women and children were kidnapped, were taken as hostages, and were slaughtered. Even Jaja's children were encouraged to slaughter Obono children in order to earn the right to wear the eagle's plume, which was a symbol at that time for someone who has killed a person in war. So that's the extent of uh, how abusive his power is shown to be in, in both places. So the imprints of Odumegege's tragedy extends into King Jaja. Characters in King Jaja refer to that war over and over, it's consequential, over and over. And at a point when uh, Jaja has come to be perceived because of his repeated victories as, as a god figure, uh, Dume Gege also fits that conceit when at the point of his death he says, I now agree that Jaja is a spirit. But Jaja indeed is not a spirit, he's just a flawed, he's just a flawed human, and he shows that he is just a flawed person. His detriment and deportation becomes a point of reversal for, for his mimic empire. And this is done sadly by Another despicable empire, which Jaja is known to have worked for. By Jaja's own account, he had supported the British in the war against the Ashanti. What is to say that before um, they got to a point of a disagreement between uh, the British interests and his own business operation, he had always been a British ally and he was willing to recruit his own men, people from his own community, to fight in wars on behalf of the British. And for one of those wars, the, the British state gave him a royal sword as a symbol of appreciation. And so you can understand why uh, the structure, his exercise of power was, was a mirror image of uh, the exercise of power of the bigger empire which was actually scoring the coast of the region at that time. There's something else about it that I want to point the attention to. At the moment when Jaja comes into conflict with the British, he calls a conference. And that conference is a response to the, to the Berlin Conference as represented in the plays. But what does it do? One would have expected that he's going to call a conference across ethnicities and build a front because at this point it was obvious that uh, the British were, were bent on colonizing the area. But he doesn't do that. He calls a conference of only Ijo kingdoms and city-states because they, have, they all have a shared interest to keep the hinterland uh, under subjection. A similar pattern plays out in the place by Olarotimi and, uh, Olarotimi and Yerima. Now, the central character in the plays of Rotimi and Yerima fits into the profile of a famous Benin monarch. Benin is shown in both plays and literature as a conflicted regional power. Benin is shown to be in conflict with itself and in conflict with its neighbor. As Obavarawe, who is also called Nogbaisi, ascended the throne of his fathers in 1888, the British were already entrenched in the Niger Delta, already entrenched. The Berlin Conference had long been decided, and a new impetus had come into, had come to crown earlier motivations 
for trade and or conquest. He reigned at a difficult time, barely nine years. He reigned at a period when traditional power structures in the region were modified or erased by the force of a plundering foreign power. But Warren West's life has inspired two historical plays, as I said, and these plays have had very successful runs in Nigerian theater. Both Yerima and Rotimi have presented a Bini story. By their own accounts, they have presented a Bini story from a Bini standpoint, as much as imagination and omission have allowed. But there are differences in the handling of material, differences in details, differences in dramaturgy. But there's a unity of purpose in the fact that they have decided to tell Benin's story. Um, Allah wrote to me in his very short preface to uh, uh, Varawa Nogbais, he says that Ob the Oba is a man who is more sinned against than he ever sinned. And Yerima says that he tried to get into the mind of this Oba and he wrote this play as a way of exonerating him from the charges of history. And uh, he feels excited that the cultural authorities in Benin uh, read this play, even in draft, uh, and were excited and adopted the story as their own version of events, which simply tells that these two playwrights have set out to write a play that positions Benin as a victim of an oppressive foreign power. That fact is fairly established. But what does it also mean when you write a play that focuses on Benin, but also has the appearance of minority nationalities that appear like vassal states in the play? What does it mean? What does it mean for a playwright to set out to write a play that serves the role of advocacy for an empire? What does it mean? It is to look at the actions and circumstances that have led to the tragedy of a central character and his people. Yerima, like Rotimi, has created a remarkable work to serve the narrative of a power center. Both playwrights present power equations that are sympathetic to Benin, but there are hints that tell that there are other sides to the story. There are hints that are not intended to diminish the main plot, but there are persons these persons and ethnicities that are at the margin are significant enough to call ourselves, to call our attention to aspects of the narratives that the playwrights have not intended. So the plays, these plays that are focused on the projection of Benin as a regional power at a troubled time also present the people, the communities at the margin as irritants, deviants, outlaws against whom the Benin monarchy directs his grace or might. Thus, the snippets of the margin become significant narratives simply by the marginality that the playwrights have placed on them. Ironically, the subalterns speak even when the playwrights have intended to beam their light solely on Benin and Britain in order to determine tragic heroism uh, and the villainy and villainy in the context of empires. It's, it's surprising that. Uh, the playwrights repeatedly refer to Benin as an empire. And it appears to me that they've taken the import of that word for granted. The implications seem to have been taken for granted. It foregrounds a center margin dialectics and a discourse of imperialism that keeps the margin repressed. It is not enough for the place to have choreographed Benin's presence to blur or mark the downsides of Benin's power as an empire building. Rather, than solely show up empathy for Benin as a monarchy and, and its monarchy, that is the basis in this place for a critique of the monarchy's failed effort to preserve itself, failed effort to also preserve its instrument and architectures of subjection. So the question arises: At whose expense, therefore, is Benin an empire? There is no doubt about the objectives of Britain's empire of pillage and plunder, but what is the tenor and import of Benin's power as an empire builder in its own right? What does it, why does it insist, therefore, to keep its grip on communities around that locality? At certain points in history, Benin extended its power as far as Lagos, Akure, Asaba, Agbo, Shekri, Orobo. Why does the Oba at this time 
try to govern these territories by force. It is because he has come to see that his power is facing an era of contraction. And because his power was facing an era of contraction, he becomes a lot more resolute to enforce his control. And that enforcement becomes, uh, leads to a series of abuses, verbal and physical abuses on the territories that he has, uh, he has decided to bring forcefully under the orbit of his, of his power. Now, in Rotimi's play, the British have come to the Oba and they want him to sign new trace papers. And the Oba says, no, I'm not going to sign the papers. The reason why I'm not going to sign the papers is because, in his words, you go over my head to tread with the Shekri people and the Orobo people. If you want me to sign this paper, you have to show me that you love me and you love my people. The implication of that statement is that he understands that the Orobo people and the Shekri people are not his people, but he insists on controlling trade in those territories. And that, for me, is a pursuit of Benin nationalism, um, which has no consideration for the opinions and the interests of those other territories. The haughtiness of Benin's might diminishes the humanity of smaller or weaker states around that locality. Here in Mass Play, the Oba says that the head of all troublemakers, quote, the head of all troublemakers are these smaller communities around him, particularly the Shekri and the Agbo people. And the Shekri people become repeated subjects of insult, of jokes, and even suspicion. Because at this point, the British have already established their presence strongly in the Shekri area, and new potentates have emerged on their own. These potentates have decided to work with the British in order to further their own interests, and they've become powerful enough to choose to erode the power of uh, Benin over their territories, however untoward their approach and morality is. Even the Oba's son-in-law and business manager, who, has been, who uh, was sent to represent the Oba's interests in the Shekri or Wari, the markets of the Shekri Aziz, aligns with these power players in the Shekri Aziz because he's been close enough to them to know that the Oba's power has become a shell of the past. And so he too becomes emboldened by profit uh, to uh, debate the Oba's decision and also to take decisions on his own. The likes of Chidure Noma and Chidudu, and you see these names repeatedly in history, these names are mentioned in both plays. They have become daring in their own threshing and accumulation and their poise to destroy the power, the control of Bini over their area. They have pitched their tent with the British who are the only people that the Oba is afraid to confront. In both plays, the Oba is afraid to confront the British, but he is more than willing to exercise force to control the localities around their area. And those localities are localities that do not only serve as a, a corridor of protection for Benin, they also serve as sources of economic wealth for Benin. Now, and so repeatedly we hear the Oba say, oh yes, he's not going to, he's, he sees himself as the moon, he's the giver of life and death, and he's not going to allow any kind of rivalry. When he says that, he's referring to the dissidents of some of his own chief, and he's also referring to the rise of potentates around these localities who are more than willing to wrestle uh, with him over the control of their deities. Of their, of their territories. Okay, let me go to the last page. In Yerima's play, Logbo, Ologbose, also called Ologbose, describes the Oba as the one who looks at death and commands death to take, and death obeys. It confirms the Oba's view of himself as the giver of life and death, who sacrifices humans when necessary. And he tells the oracle that he was willing to sacrifice himself and his own children. Now, but the question I ask is, if the Oba's head is what the preservation of his empire. Why is he willing to sacrifice his children? At this point, I see that it is mere posturing because there are indications in the play that one of his sons had killed someone in error and he shielded the person from justice. So beneath, uh, whatever the tradition allows at the time also comes across to us as 
a society that is built on hierarchy, where judicial omissions are possible, where justice can also be uneven. There's a measure of rebellion that we see uh, in the play that shows that the aristocracy itself has is, clo is close enough to the upper power, uh, not just to undermine it, but also notice that there were new realities around the area that were uh, undercutting the control of the Oba, and they were willing to pursue their own self-preservation. So at the moment of peril in, the, in, uh, in uh, Rotimi's play, Iya said the prime minister tells the Oba to surrender his power. He says the Oba should allow his power to die for Bini to survive. And it appears to be that that has been the re-intention in the relationship between the Oba and the aristocracy. From the moment when he gets to the throne, he means very stiff opposition. So at this time, the, the system of governance in Benin has become very, very contradictory. There were, there were forces and elements within the aristocracy that were willing to undermine the power of of the monarchy, and that also weakens the ability, the capacity of the monarchy to maintain its grip over the communities that the monarchy has come to see as a vassal state. In conclusion, Minima, Rotimi, and Yerima have dramatized an important era in the history of the Niger Delta region. The complex power structures of the colonial period have continued to intrigue historians and literary writers, perhaps because there are patterns that have persisted. And this is why Benedict Benabai says, and I quote, that history plays present realities in spite of recounting the past. The reason for their creation has contemporary prompting and expediency. End of quotation. Writing about the past raises a lot of questions, particularly when the subjects of short texts are iconic personages in culture, and politics. But this is nature of drama to confront its community without apologies, according to Motosha. There's no doubt that Minima, Rutimi, and Yerima know their material well enough to subject it to art. To know this place as history plays is to know their content and context. For indeed, the plays have done what every history play is expected to do, and that is to take from historical events, subject them to the principles of creativity, and reconstruct the path for the purpose of posterity. I believe that posterity will, posterity will look upon this place as places that are very important contribution to the conversation on the Niger data. It's past, it's present, and possibly it's future. Thank you for listening. Albari, thank you ever so much. It's a, a, a wonderful um, and imaginative rereading of this um, collection of plays um, on this very important moment in, in Niger Delta history, as you say. Um, I, I, I'm neither a, a literary scholar nor a historian, so you'll think my question's um, naive, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask naive questions while those in the audience prepare theirs. Um, I was thinking of three directions, really, in which this, um, uh, this collection of plays and the stories that they relate um, seem very resonant and important. And the first is a kind of obvious one um, in relation to the, the parallel discussions around oil, but, but palm oil and um, contemporary um, politics of oil. Um, and I wonder whether um, you see obvious metaphors um, in the ways that these authors are writing about the past that might be um, represented in discussions about the contemporary politics um, of oil. And I was thinking of that in, in two ways, really. You talk about the, um, the ways in which these plays were written in the 1990s um, and focus on um, those political leaders who are trying to blockade the palm oil trade, essentially, um, and, um, and prevent the British from um, uh, access to the to hinterland markets. Um, and they are stories of a particular kind of um, a monarchy, a particular kind of big man, a particular kind of um, a nouveau riche, 
Um, and I wondered whether that might be read against um, the, the politics of military rule um, during the 1990s and the kind of critique around despotism and violence and impunity um, that are, are happening um, under Babangida and, and particularly under Abacha. Um, so that was one um, side of it. The other side was um, precisely this incredibly imaginative rereading of these texts from the margin, if you like, of not reading these texts as, as stories of uh, simply colonial uh, encounter, but actually the stories of um, intra-regional dynamics going on um, within the pages, if you like. And the question here, I think, is the extent to which you might identify a kind of process of reimagining re or reinventing tradition through the plays. To what extent did people kind of actually identify under these ethnic labels in the late 19th century? Or are these not, in fact, the kind of products of that colonial encounter and the kind of post-colonial politics. It's no coincidence, right, that actually you're talking about Ichikere and Uruhubu, um, who during the 1990s are in conflict over access to, um, to, to oil resources um, and the like. So I just wonder the extent to which the dynamism of the city-states um, is captured in, in these texts or, or overlaid by a kind of post-colonial narrative. So it was those two dimensions, I thought. Okay, uh, in the course of this study, I, I became more excited about the fact that uh, many mass plays were staged in the 90s. In fact, uh, Odume Gege had the most, the, the most success, successful stage run in 1997, two years after the death of Ken Sarawa, two years after Ken Sarawa was killed by the Nigerian state. And uh, when I started reading this place, I saw that's, that's a lot of replication of power. In fact, the truth is, the habit of power has not changed, okay? Uh, the habit has not changed. The actors have changed, but the habits of power has not changed in that area. Uh, if you look at all the conflict around uh, petroleum, uh, it's between the Nigerian state, okay, uh, that it's like a mirror image of what Jaja or uh, Bavara when was in the 19th century, the Nigerian state, the local actors, the potentates within the Nigerian state are active in the process of subjugating their people and denying them the resources uh, that they should get uh, from uh, the extraction on their lands. On the other hand, you have big oil, multinational, transnational companies present and that is like a mirror image of British interests at the time. So at every point in history, there's always been this triangular relationship between foreign powers, okay, interested in the resources of the Delta, local actors that are willing to work with them, okay, at the expense of their own people, you know, and then the victims. If we look at that, if we take that image from um, the, the period of slave trade to the period of palm oil trade, and to the present the post-colonial uh, period now, you find out that the habit of power is the same. Um, so, so there are a lot of people who have killed into the oil industry as it is today, uh, not because uh, they have the interest of their communities, they are chiefs too, they have the interest of their communities at heart. No, what they want to do is to align with big oil and big government. And of course, the Nigerian state is definitively big government. Okay, in order to get what they can get, further their ownness uh, at the expense of the, of the common man or even communities that are actually oil-bearing communities. So that the resemblance, the resemblance is, is there. Uh, I wish that uh, as a people, we can look at, if we cannot look at history, we can look at art that has been produced about that era and learn from the art. Because when we discuss the Niger that has passed, uh, uh, the anger is, is one-sided. Uh, we tend to focus more on what the foreign powers have done in, in, the, in the region, uh, from slavery to colonialism. And most times we do not pay attention to the local enablers or the mimic imperialism that 
was actually operational at that time. You know Obare Kimi. Obare Kimi is one of our uh, very illustrious historians. And he says that uh, in the 19th century, there were people who were sub-imperialists. And what did they do? They found a rule for themselves. And some of them even exploited their neighbors more than the British did. That's Obare Kimi's account. And when I look at that statement and I compare it to the representations depictions in this place, I think that Baru, the characterization that we see in this play is consistent with what Obari Kimi uh, said about some atos, some elements in the Niger Delta in the 19th century. I don't know if I answered your question. Absolutely. No, thank you. I'm sure we'll circle back to some of these points. But let's open it up to uh, questions from the room. I'm afraid these lights are glaring straight at me, so I can hardly see a thing. But I think there's a, a hand at the back there. Yeah, go for it, please. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, just to build up on the last point that you made, uh, as I was sitting here listening to a common theme on the narrative among the plays that you have highlighted, I realized that uh, African uh, playwrights tend of like they kind of like have this um, um, uh, sort of monotone narrative that they try to disassociate themselves from being enablers of colonialism or being uh, part of the uh, aggressive colonialist system that we see in those years. But then I'm, I'm thinking to myself to say then, what becomes the future? for African play, 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 playwriting if we tend to only focus on the aspect that, you know, colonialism was, uh, quote unquote, um, the evil that was brought, brought on by outsiders. And yes, there was that complicit role that we played ourselves as Africans in enabling that kind of environment. So where are we heading with a new narrative on looking at an African narrative on playwriting that doesn't dissociate itself from colonialism because we were part of that system? Of course, this is not to deny the fact that we were were victims of the system, but we were equally enablers of that system. And there were people within that African society that were kind of like benefiting from that colonial um, aspect of our history. So where are we heading? Because it seems to be like a common narrative among us, almost all playwrights, among us all accounts of history that we tend to, uh, to find in African literature that refers to colonialism. So what new aspects are we trying to bring in as Africans to this um, um, area of uh, history? history assessment. Thank you. Okay. Um, as a playwright myself, I'll say the writers who write what uh, appeals to them. Okay. Um, you cannot draw, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot draw up a program for the creative process. Writers who write uh, whatever appeals to them. And if you look at the date of, uh, of the plays, you find that uh, many African states are very young states. And if you look at that, colonialism is a very recent event in many African states. So um, uh, that story has not been exhausted. Uh, there's still a lot of narrative there. I mean, uh, Europeans are still writing about, about uh, 16th century, 17th century, 15th century. OK? Writers are still writing works that are dated in the 18th century in Europe. So it would be wrong to, to say that Africans should not write about what happened in the 19th century, OK? But what is important is, is that those who are going to uh, deploy those historical materials in their work should be perceptive enough to create the kind of literature that can help uh, us move forward, even if it simply means helping the cultural space move forward. That's a very important point that you have made. And that point is that. Uh, this study is not to excuse the activities of the colonial powers, not at all. It is not to excuse it. It is simply to say that on the strength of this place, it is important for us to also look at indigenous power systems, particularly because there's a replication of that, those power systems in the present. And if we cannot look at them, if we cannot look at them in history, if we cannot look at them in other fields of study, then literature gives us a very subtle window through which we can look at this past and tell ourselves the truth. There's a lot. Uh, before before I move, I, I move from from uh, 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 this question. There's, there's a lot that is happening that uh, I think we should look at. Uh, 
almost everywhere in Europe, there's a conversation about holding the past accountable, OK? Uh, particularly because of the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. The past is being held accountable all over the world, except Africa. Except in Africa, there are cities like my city that is named after a colonial foreign secretary. Why don't we have a, a political will to change the name of a city? OK, there are monuments that are built uh, to commemorate people who are slave traders, power holders, indigenous power holders who were slave traders, like the Tinubu Square, for instance. But Antinubu was a very powerful slave trader. So if we are going to say that uh, monuments that are built to slavery and to colonialism in other places of the world should go down. Why are we not holding that, uh, that conversation at home? I think it's important that we should hold that conversation at home. And it is our ability to hold that conversation at home that will give us a, a force of value when we engage the rest of the world. We cannot assume uh, that there are no monuments to slavery and colonialism in Africa. Uh, we have entire rivers named after, after colonialists, entire rivers named after slave drivers and slave hunters, and they're still there. We're not changing those names. Okay, so if the world is at the point of reflection over its past, Africa too must be at the point of reflection over its past. And I dare say that in the process of reflection, we should be bold enough not to look at only what the foreigners did. We should also look at what we did as participants in the economy or political culture of the time. That's my take on that. And I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. And if you didn't all know, like, just how proximate and close the history of the naming of Port Harcourt was to where you're currently sat, um, Lewis Harcourt, after whom Port Harcourt is named, his family seat is at Newnham Courtney, uh, which is just outside Oxford. The Harcourt Arboretum, owned by the university, is named after the same family. Um, so there's a very proximate connection between this institution and Port Harcourt, um, permeated through precisely this colonial legacy. Lord Lugard named the new city of Port Harcourt after the Secretary of State for the Colonies. Good. More questions? Yes, Jeffrey. Thank you very much, sir, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I was, I'm just curious, as a Nigerian that probably I'm schooled in Nigeria secondary school, how, how did the narrative change? How did it become, if you tell an average um, young school leaver in Nigeria of Jaja, who he says is that man that the colonials sent on an exile? So I, I'm just curious, how did that narrative change that we don't get to hear this? kind of things. Of course, I know at the point history used to be taught in secondary schools. Now, history is not even, sometimes it's even removed from the curriculum. It, was it because of the emergence of literature immediately after or during colonialism or after? Or now, I, I'm just curious how the narrative changed that. When you tell a young Nigerian that Jaja, he tells you this is what has happened to him and those kind of things. Um, I'm also curious, um, when when the when the Bene, um, kingdom was expanding towards the Bini kingdom was expanding towards um, I mean to Akure even as far as Lagos um, were were they intentional or were some happenstance? For instance, I mean there I know there there are a lot of conversations between the the Oba of Lagos and 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 the Benin and then there is always this conversation that it happenstance the the prince just came. And then he happened to just stay there. Was it in te was, the, was the expansion? I guess my question is: Was the expansion sometimes intentional, or was it just happenstance that the prince settled somewhere, and then he has to um, always give a kind of give feedback to to the to the Benin Empire? And then um, the, that's the second. The last is just um, I'm curious about the, the, the modes of transportation too, because I, I know because of. Um, been in been coastal areas, um, these Niger that have been coastal areas, was, was, is, does this also prof, um, provide an explanation for how the expansion came, or was the expansion ma majorly through the internet? Was it just through the mainland, or was there an expansion 
in line with the coastal lands. I mean, if you look at Lagos, that is also a coastal area. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, first, I'm going to say that uh, I'm still looking at literature, okay? Uh, incidentally, it turns out to be that I'm looking at literature that has, that has deployed the resources of history. Uh, but let me say something about Jaja. The story, the, 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 the actual story about Jaja has always been there. Uh, we, we simply did with history with what other people, other people around the world do with history, okay? People around the world. I mean, uh, scholars like you are the persons who look, who look underneath things to be able to look at other sides of history. But uh, political culture around the world chooses to tell the history that serves its interest and is not peculiar to us. For instance, you can imagine that someone will tell you that Columbus discovered America, okay? And it's actually taught in history books. And in actuality, people were living there for ages. How do you discover, I mean, it's something basic. How do you discover a place where people live, okay? Uh, and then there's also a version that he never got to the American mainland, okay? North America, he never got to North America, okay? Or when Americans tell you that the church fathers, okay, founded a country that is built on freedom and justice. And they don't tell you that there was genocide against the Native Americans who were there, genocide for years. And up until today, those people are still in clusters of settlement and they live with that history. So that's what we do with history. And that's the same, that's the same reason that makes Colonial Britain tell you that he's in Africa for a civilizing mission. He wants to bring you from darkness into, it wants to bring you from darkness into light. So we've done the same thing with our own history. We've taken our history and we've, look, we've looked at only what would make us look right. Uh, in post-colonial Nigeria, it was important for us to tell our story in a way that shows the villainy of Britain as a conquering power, okay? And if we were going to look at the downsides of our own political systems, it will look as if we're given, we're justifying what the British did. So we left those things out. But I think that it's a time for writers and academics to go back to those issues and look at characters like Jaja, characters like Madame Tinubu, and tell precisely, I mean, it's possible they build cities, they contribute to life. I mean, there's a lot of money from slave plantations in the University of Oxford. So you can choose to look at the contribution of those persons to the growth of the university, okay? You can also choose to go beyond the growth of the university and look at the plantations. And you will understand that a great deal of what has been built is built on the bones of people who were victims of an economic system, the power system. So Jaja's story did not change. We simply did what people do with history. And we're doing the same thing now with the story of the Civil War. Okay? That's the same thing we're doing with the Biafran Civil War. Okay? Now, that's the same thing we're doing with Boko Haram. There are defenders of it. That's the same thing we did with, the, with militancy. Okay? We looked at one part of it and we said, okay, the militants are people who are fighting for our interest. Okay? Now, now we we'll look at the big picture. It appears that the militants were people who were fighting for their own interests. If we look at the big picture. So human beings are very careful about how they present history because the presentation of history helps in the image building of a people. So people choose only that which makes them look very nice in the eyes of, of people. Okay, now to begin, I can't tell exactly, it, it's difficult for me to trace uh, the motivations for uh, Benin's movement. Uh, from the Benin mainland to the other places where Benin was able to extend its power. But I can say that in all historical accounts, Benin is an empire. And Benin simply did what empires do. Empires do not stay within their borders. Empires extend beyond their borders in order to control the lives of others and use the resources of uh, those people to develop the mainland. And that's what Benin did. I was really struck throughout your talk uh, by the use of the word indigenous, which, um, while very familiar to us, 
uh, in the United States, as you, you know, discussed the, our history with indigenous people, is a word that's, and an analytic, that's really not used in African studies, or indeed in uh, a lot of white global north um, African histories. And I'm really curious about why you're uh, choosing to use that word and, and what you mean by it. The word indigen is a very regular word in cultural conversations in Nigeria, okay? And when we use that, we simply, we're simply saying that this man has ownership. He belongs to this land ancestrally, okay? So the indigen is actually the opposite of a settler. So if we were to come to America, for instance, are you listening to me? If we were to come to America, for instance, we will look at all the white settlers as simply settlers or strangers, okay? <laughs> as we call them in Nigeria. And we'll look at the Native Americans as the indigenous, the people who own the land, okay? Um, I do not know the reason why scholarship in America is uncomfortable with the word indigenous. But indigenous is the term that we use very often to refer to, uh, refer to the connection between people and the communities that they belong to, okay? So if I go to the LMA ethnic nationality where I come from now, uh, uh, without a doubt, everybody knows that I'm an indigenous of LMA. It's as simple, I live there, okay? I belong to that place. If I go to Port Harcourt, I live in Port Harcourt. There are people who are indigenous of Port Harcourt, and those are the Equerry people. They are the ones who will tell you we own this land. So the ownership of the land, culturally and historically, is what defines indigenship. Uh, in the cultural conversations in Nigeria. I don't know in what sense you people use it in America. I don't know if you think it's pejorative in America, but in Nigeria it is not. In our own cultural conversation, it's not. Uh, part of the difference could be that we are, we are I come from the Englishes, okay? Uh, the American English, uh, I know it's also part of the Englishes, but it's closer to the mainland, main English, I mean, British English than Nigerian English. So uh, we've domesticated a lot of words and we give some kind of new meanings to, to those words. And I, I believe that we're, we're entitled to those domestications because when a language leaves its home and goes to another home to impose itself on that, on that place, that language has opened itself up for all sorts of modifications. And, uh, and that's why I'm one of the advocates for the standardization of Nigerian English. I don't think that a Nigerian should bother to speak British English. Uh, and of course, there are, there are diverse forms of varieties of English even in, in the UK. So why should we try to speak the Queen's English when the English language has been in Nigeria for over 100 years? And in these 100 years, we've been imparting on the language. We've imparted on that language enough to call it our own without necessarily uh, putting the, again, indigenous languages at the service, okay? So, yeah, so I'm speaking from, uh, from a position of culture, uh, language culture in my, in my homeland. Thank you. Indeed, maybe we should switch to pidgin. So, <laughs> make we continue I'm with Rachel. Uh, <laughs> now, now. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the idea of like the use of history for community building, um, and I'm guessing that some of these kind of discourses about King Jagger come or kind of circulating locally even when they fell out of um of school books and so i'm kind of interested in the circulation of these plays as well are they these kind of um using history to kind of explore questions of morality and power whether these histories have a kind of purchase across Nigeria or a purchase in bits of Nigeria, kind of who is, who is the them discussing? Um, are they kind of national heroes now that are then part of a generalized discussion or are these figures that have far more purchase in some parts of the country than in others? Thank you. Well, interestingly, uh, let me start from uh, the concept of heroism. Interestingly, uh, the concept of heroism in literature is that which takes flaw 
tragic flaw into account. So um, it's not it's not the expectation of these playwrights to create perfect human beings. Their central characters are not supposed to be perfect. This guy, these characters are tragic characters, and tragic characters must have flaws, uh, according to the tradition that has been able that's been established in in the culture of tragedy across time. Okay, uh, Greek theater is actually built. Greek tragic tradition is built on uh, the creation of uh, very important figures uh, in society that have flawed people too. So uh, my position about this is that if we're looking at history, we do not have to be ashamed of, it's because we tend to be ashamed of the wrong things in the past, okay? That's why we do not own them up. And because we don't own them up, we don't deal with them. So what we do is that we just sweep them under the carpet. Now, there's a new awakening around the world that is insisting that we have to look at them, tell ourselves that those things happened and that they were wrong, and that we can move forward from, from that point, okay? It is wrong to tell a child, and it does not, it does not take away from the greatness of Jaja as a person. The fact that he built a community, a very thriving city state in a very short while, I mean, from, from the movement to uh, Opopo to the island in 1869 to the point when he was sent on Eza in 1891, that's a very short time to build such a powerful city-state. So it means that he was a powerful builder of society. But at the same time, uh, there were also minuses in the way he exercised power. So to know him for me is to know both sides of his personality. Now, if you tell me to look at all the fact that he was a very powerful person who contended with British power and got the wrong side of the equation, you're not telling me the full story. Luckily for us, we have these plays, particularly Odume Gege, that tells the other side of Jaja as a dictatorship, as, as somebody who ran a dictatorship, as a tyrant, as a very, very brutal uh, personage of power. It's important that we should look at that. Again, uh, when you talk about Bini, the Oba of Bini is a God figure. Even till today, the Oba of Bini is, is a God figure. Nigeria's modernity and secularity, in a way, has reduced uh, the presence of the Oba. But Dioba still remains a God figure. And what that simply means is that generations of people around that locality have come to see Dioba as infallible. But history itself tells us that Oba might be a God figure, might be a cultural powerhouse, might be a powerful symbol for his people's awakening and progress, but he's also human. And that his exercise of power has been injurious to certain people who did not have as much power as he had. People within his domain and people in other communities that he made vassals of. If we can engage this truth, then maybe we can build a future that would not replicate these errors. The point is that we are not engaging this truth well enough, okay? That's why, for instance, in the United States, the police system it still runs as if it's a police system running a plantation. It still runs like that. Okay, the, pre the prison industrial complex is a, is, is, a, is a replacement for the plantations. Okay, because the law, the 13th Amendment says nobody can be held as a slave here unless he's a prisoner. So if you put a black man or a Latino in jail, what you have simply done is to reduce him from citizen to slave. And there's a network between the judiciary, the police, the owners of the prisons that is designed to constantly bring people into jail. And that's how it's structured. It's obvious to us, but we don't want to engage it. When you look at... Uh, the fear that a black American has about the police. It's something cultural, it has a long history. People think that, well, you can just snap your fingers and wipe it away. No, it's a long history. The police was part of the culture of slavery. It was part of it. 
the police was an arm of enforcement for slavery. It's the same thing in Nigeria. What we complain about the police, I've taught people the Nigerian police is an offshoot of colonialism. The British did not form the police in order to serve the people. They formed the police in order to enforce their power as a conquering power. So if you have a police culture that serves the political class and does not serve the people, it is a colonial hangover. So if we understand these things, we position ourselves better to engage them and to bring the changes, policy changes, operational changes that will make life better for all of us. I think we should look at history. There's a lot in history that will tell us about the things that are wrong with the past and give us uh, a fuller understanding about the things that are wrong with the present. I think so. I don't know if I answered your question. If I didn't answer it, I can, if, I, if I didn't answer it, I can still have, I can try to make it shorter, shorter it again. So uh, time is uh, against us and we're, we're, we're coming to a close, but um, appropriately, Miles has the, the last question. Thanks, Professor. Um, I, I want to ask, you've, you've really stressed, um, for those of us who are historians, you've made us very happy because you stressed the value of history continuously. Um, but I wanted to ask the opposite question in a sense. What do historians have to learn from playwrights uh, in terms of the way they tell stories. Uh, historians have a certain way of telling stories, a certain set of techniques, um, but maybe we're not very good at communicating with certain kinds of publics uh, about the stories we have to tell. I, I, I now, as a result of your paper, want to go and watch these plays to see how they portray history. But I wondered if you could tell us a bit about uh, from your perspective, um, what can we learn from the storytelling techniques of playwrights, uh, either in this place or in your own work, uh, that might uh, help us uh, tell uh, better stories, uh, more useful stories maybe about the past? First, I'm going to say that the historian's job, it's important. And uh, if a historian chooses to write a history play, he ceases at that moment to be a historian. He becomes a playwright. Okay? Uh, interestingly, you can be both a historian and, and be a playwright. There are different kinds of writing. I mean, writing, uh, being a historian requires that you have to put uh, history on paper. I, I do not think that uh, the historian has to change his approach to history uh, in order to communicate better. In fact, I think that uh, the approach of the historian is as relevant as the ap approach of the playwright. For instance, uh, anybody can look at these plays and say, well, they're plays, okay? This is just art. It's not true. What has happened here is not true. And of course, you cannot contend with it on the basis of truth as we know it, historical truth as we know it. Because uh, the playwrights would have taken liberty, okay? in order to make the play come out. They would have taken liberty, choose what to remove, choose what to add in order to, to, to make the material fit into the dramaturgy that they have in mind. So, uh, but, but, I, but I understand that it's, it's important that uh, historians should write plays from time to time uh, because you can actually take the material that you have, the historical material that you have, and put them into the form of drama. I mean, people are writing even historical novels now. People are writing historical poetry. So, so frankly, uh, it's, that's, that's a thin line, and the thin line is form, okay? The thin line is form. Uh, even for fiction, or historical fiction, or memoir, uh, that is couched as, as prose, there's a difference between what a historian writing an academic paper, for instance, an academic test, would do. Uh, there's a difference between that and what someone who is a writer who is writing, uh, who is writing a novel that is historical, a play that is historical, would do. Uh, it will not. It will not be right for historians to sacrifice their own mode of communication for the mode of communication that uh, creative people adopt. Because once you get to the creative firmament, what you have done from, from the position, from the first time that you get into that, you've actually surrendered veracity. You've, you've surrendered truth, okay? Uh -huh. So you've come into 
the environment of creativity and you surrender truth. I think that for us to understand history better, we should have people like you who tell actual history, okay? Uh, you should be there so that at certain points we can evaluate what we do as creative people and, and measure them against what the actual history says. Uh, if we all transform trained historians into playwrights who write history plays, we would have lost a lot because we will, we will give a weapon to people who are history deniers to say, this is just art, it's artistic representation, and it's not history. Please, don't learn from playwrights. Continue to communicate the way you're communicating. But if you choose to be a playwright, please be a playwright without sacrificing your training as a historian. We need both, both categories of individuals in the world. Brilliant. Thanks, Abari. So we're going to draw things to a close. Um, do join us uh, for further conversation uh, over drinks at the Royal Oak. Do please look out for um, adverts for another event at which Abari will be speaking, reading his poetry on the 2nd of December, which is going to be at St. Luke's Chapel um, uh, in an event called Eyes on Africa uh, with other writers from around the university. And do please join me in thanking Obari for a wonderful talk. Thank you.